There's on like you had nine, there's something like your deeds, God, you rule eternally, your kingdom lasts for all generations. I rule, and I rule, you will rule forever and ever. Uh, and I will constrict God's people, and I will bless God's people with peace, merciful parent, favor sealed with goodness. You both the walls of Yushayim, for we trust in you, King God on high, sovereign of worlds. Whenever the ark would travel, Moses would say, Arise out of nine, scatter your enemies. May those that hate you flee from you. For Torah shall come from Zion, the word of Adonai from Jerusalem. Blessed is the one who in his holiness gave the Torah to Israel. Page 101. Praise be the name of the sovereign of the universe. Praise be your crown and your place. May your love for your people Israel last forever, and may the salvation of your right hand be revealed to your people in your holy house. Grant us the goodness of your life and accept our prayer with mercy. May it be your will that we be granted a long, good life, and may I be counted among the righteous, so that you will have mercy on me and protect me in all that is mine and all that belongs to your people Israel. For you are the one who nourishes all and sustains all. You rule over all. You are the one who rules over earthly rulers, and sovereignty is yours. I'm a servant, servant of the blessed, blessed Holy One. I bow before God, before the honor of God's Torah at all times. Not in the human do I trust, nor do I rely on any angel, but in the God of heaven, who is the true God, whose Torah is true, and whose prophets are true, and who multiplies the deeds of goodness and truth. In God do I trust, and in God's holy, honored name I speak praises. May it be your will that you open my heart to Torah, and completely answer my heart's desires and those of your people Israel for good, for life, for peace. Amen. Hashem, our God. 
May he help, shield, and save all who seek refuge in him. And let's say amen. 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 As there's no Cohen, arise. Um, Duffy, Ben. What's your last name? What's your name? They both. Duffy, Duffy, Ben, Duffy. Blessed is he who in his holy gave the Torah to his people, Israel. You'll go ahead and just take your seat, seat. And just touch it and kiss it. so today's Torah portion is called Faish Lak. You can be seated. And we're going to see how Yaakov. Uh, leaves be- from before the angels. Lord, <laughs> La uh la mitzaka uh no la la matza chain ba um ba of ne ka ba ukata denai elahina kalam a shenatan lani tortime the kaye o lanatan but a kayu ba ukata nai no tain ha torah Alright and today's Torah portion the Vaishlak we're just going to go ahead and we're going to read our seven portions. So if you want to go ahead and flip there. We're coming today out of first sheet. Feel like it's chapter 32. It is first sheet, chapter 32. And let's just go ahead and read um, the first uh, from four to seven. 32, four to seven. And Jacob sent messengers before him to Esau's brothers, to the land of Seir, to the country of Edom. And he commanded them, saying, Thus will you speak to my lord of Esau. Your, your servant Jacob says thus, I have sojourned with Laban, and stayed there until now. And I have oxen, donkeys, flocks, men servants, women servants, and I have sent to tell my lord, so I can find favor in your sight. And the messengers returned to Jacob, saying, We came to your brother Esau, and he too is walking to meet you, and for 400 men are with him. That doesn't bode well, does it? All right. Blessed is he who in his holiness gave the Torah to his people of Israel. May he, be ble- may he bless our fathers of whom he talking about Kolf. Bless David and David. Who has been called in honor of the All Present, in honor of the Torah, in honor of the Shabbat. As a reward for this, may the Holy Blessed One protect and deliver him from all troubles and distress, all infections and illness, and send blessings and success to all the work of his hands, together with all of Israel, his brethren. And let's say, Amen. Amen. All right, you'll sit over here. Oh, this one doesn't have the portions. Can someone go get the uh, the starring translation for me? You Thank you. All right, the next one. So now we know that Esav is coming with 400 men. 400 fighting men. 400 fighting men, to be exact, yes. Verses 14 and 13. He stayed there that night. Then he chose from among his possessions the following as a present for Esav, his brother, 
200 female goats and 20 males, 200 female sheep and 20 males, 30 milk camels and their colts, 40 cows and 10 bulls, 20 female donkeys and 10 colts. He turned them over to his servants, every drove by itself, and it said to his servants, cross over in front of me and keep a space between each drove and the next one. He instructed the servant in front, when he saw my brother meets you and asks you, whose servant are you, where are you going, and whose animals are these, then you are to say, they belong to you, your servant, Yaakov, and they are a present he has sent to my lord Esau, and Yaakov himself is just behind us. He also instructed the second servant and third and all that followed the droves, when you encounter Esau, you are to speak to him in the same way, and you are to add, add and there, just behind us, is your servant Yaakov. For he said, I will appease him first with the person that goes ahead of me, then after that I will see him myself, and maybe he will be friendly towards me. So the present crossed over ahead of him, and he himself stayed at the night of, in the camp. So scripture says, so the scripture says to uh, come to terms quickly with our adversary who's taking us to court. And so what we see here is Yaakov is trying very quickly to appease his enemy, or at least a perceived enemy, Esau, who seems to be coming at him with an army. The next section begins in verse 31. Section about thinning out. As the sun rose upon him, he went on past Peniel, limping at the hip. This is why, uh, uh, yeah, this is why to this day the people of Israel do not eat the thigh muscle that pass, passes along the hip socket, because the man struck Yaakov's hip at his socket. Yeah, okay. Yaakov raised his eyes and looked out, and there, he, uh, and there was Esau coming and 400 men with him. So Yaakov divided the children between Leah and Rachel and the two slave girls, putting the slave girls and their children first, Leah and her children second, and Rachel and uh, Yosef last. I love that detail. There are no prizes for guessing which one is his favorite. Um, <laughs> some kids know that they are not daddy's favorite. Okay, the next one begins in chapter 33, verse 6. And the slave girls approached with their children, and they prostrated themselves. Leah, too, and her children approached and prostrated themselves, and last came... Yosef. Yosef and Rachel, and they prostrated themselves. Esau asked, what was the meaning of this procession, procession sorry, of droves I encountered? And he answered, it was to win my Lord's favor. Esau replied, I have plenty already, my brother. Keep your possessions for yourself. The cove said, no, please. If now I have won your favor, then accept my gifts. Just seeing your face has been like seeing the face of God. Now that I have, now that you have received me, please accept the gift I have, the gift, yeah, the gift I have brought you. For God has dealt kindly with me, and I have enough. Thus he urged him until he accepted it. And so, all these years, Yaakov has had this horrible meeting planned where he thinks Esau is going to kill him, and it ends up Esau hasn't been angry for like the last 20 years. Um, Yaakov has gotten more self worked up for absolutely no reason. Or at least that's the way it seems to be. 34, verse 1. One time, Dinah, the daughter of Leah, whom she had borne to Yaakov, went out to visit the local girls. And Shechem, the son of Hamor, the Hebe, the local ruler saw her 
grabbed her, raped her, and humiliated her. But actually, he was strongly attracted to Dinah, the daughter of Yaakov. He fell in love with the girl and tried to win her affection. Shechem spoke with his father, Hamor, and said, Get this girl for me. I want her to be my wife. When Yaakov heard that he had defiled Dinah, his daughter, his sons were with his livestock in the field. So Yaakov restrained himself until they came. Hamor, the father of Shechem, went out to Yaakov to speak with him, just as Yaakov's sons were coming in from the field. When they heard what had happened, the men were saddened and were very angry at the outrage this man had committed against Israel by raping Yaakov's daughter, something that is simply not done. And so what happens? They say we can, you can marry our daughter, our sister, if every man is circumcised. And then when the men are in pain, they go in and they kill absolutely everyone in the city. Perhaps one of the worst chapters of our history of, of, regarding the forefathers. The next one is in 35 verse 12. Moreover, the land which I gave to Abraham and Isaac, I will give to you and I will give the land to your descendants after you. And God went up, <clears throat> went up from him there where he had spoken with him. Yaakov set up a standing stone in the place where he had spoken with him, a stone pillar. Then he poured out a drink offering on it and poured oil on it. Yaakov called the place where God spoke with him, Beit El. Then they traveled on from Beit El, and while there was still some distance to go before arriving in Ephrath, Rachel went into labor, and she had great difficulty with it. While she was undergoing this hard labor, the midwife said to her, Don't worry, this is also a son for you. But she died in childbirth. As she was dying, she named her son Ben-Ani, son of my grief. But his father called him Benjamin, son of the right hand, son of the south. So Rachel died and was buried on the way to Ephrath, that is Bethlehem. Yaakov set up a standing stone on her grave. It is the standing stone of Rachel's grave to this day. And the last one is 36 verse 20. And notice we've gone from Ben-Ani to Benjamin, son of suffering to son of the right hand. It's a picture of the Mashiach of Yeshua. He's gone from suffering to now seated at the right hand of the Father. The next one is 36 verse 20. Just do your best with those. <laughs> like this. Um, these are the descendants of Sarir, uh, the Hori, the local inhabitants. Lotan, Shavel, Sitson, Hana, Dishan, Etzer, and Dishan. They were the chieftain's, uh, chieftain's descendant from the Hori, the people of Seir in the land of Eden. The sons of Lotan were Hori, Hermon. Lotan's sister was Tamara, the son of. Wait, wait a second. That's three verses. Okay. Yeah, it was about that. Okay. All right. So there's a little detail here that I want to point out to you. And it is a detail. We're good. Um, that's seven portions. It's a place right near Beit Lechem. Beit Lechem. Bethlehem. That is actually very important to the prophets. But I want to talk a little bit about it. You see, the place is called Migdal Eder. Migdal Eder. What is Migdal Eder? I wish... Um, I wish your mother was here. She would know this one. Um, the Tower of the Flock. The Tower of the Flock. Migdal Eder, the Tower of the Flock. It is a place near Beit Lechem. And this is very important because the prophets tell us that Mashiach will be born in Beit Lechem. It likens him, and it says that he will come from Migdal Eder. And the sages tell us that the Messiah will rule from a tower. Migdal Eder, the Tower of the Flock. And I want to put this into some perspective here because it's very important for Messianic Judaism that we understand the importance of the phrase, the tower to the flock. Who is the flock? No. The flock actually is different. What is the flock? The lost sheep of what? The house of Israel. And Messiah actually refers to the church as a different pasture. He says we'll have to bring them in as well. But the flock, but what are they being brought into? The house of Israel. 
Messianic Judaism exists as Migdol Eder, the tower of the flock to the house of Israel. We were talking about this last week, salt to the land, Aretz, the land of Israel, and a light to the Goyim, a light to Gentiles. Messianic Judaism has a special responsibility to the house of Israel. To the house of Israel. And you ask yourself, how do we come to this conclusion that he will reign from a tower, from this tower called Migdol Eder? Here's how we know it. And I'm going to say something that might blow your minds. I hope not, because we said it a few weeks ago. But the Tower of Babel, uh, of Babel the, the, the Tower of Babel, was actually a good thing. How many of us know it's a good thing? One world government, one language. Why do I say it's a good thing? Because Messiah Yeshua is going to do all of that. He's going to bring in one world government. He's going to give us one holy tongue. But what was wrong with the Tower of Babel is that it was out of place. It was at the wrong season. It was being done by the wrong people. And when we see an attempt at globalism in the modern day, it's the same thing. The right idea, one world government, one world leader, wrong time, wrong place, wrong people. Mashiach Yeshua is going to come back and he's going to do the Tower of Babel correctly. It's not going to be a tower of building up to our pride and making a name for ourselves, but it's going to be a tower that exists for the flock, for the house of Israel. This is very important for us today because the house of Israel, we are scared. And I say we are scared. Why are we scared? Because we see an attack in Israel, the worst thing that's happened since the Holocaust to the house of Israel. We see anti-Semitism on the rise all across the world. Even in my little hick town of Ashland, Tennessee, I see it. Guys, we are scared. And we have to remember that in this day, there is Migdal Eder, there is the tower for the flock, Messiah Yeshua himself. He is the tower. And I'll end it with this story. There's a great story about the uh, Jews who were coming from Russia. And we're not, not Russia, I'm sorry. This is 48. Uh, in 1948, Jews were fleeing to Israel from all the European nations which they had been expelled from. And they were trying to make Aliyah, they were trying to come to the land of Israel. And there were Gazans and Palestinians all lined up and Jordanians with guns on the coast. And they would not allow a ship to dock. And so what the ships did is they stopped in the Mediterranean Sea and they threw the Jews basically overboard and said, go swim. And a lot of people would be swimming in the middle of the night because they couldn't be seen. The lights were all off. The ship's lights were all off. They would swim in the night towards shore and many of them would drown. And the survivors were huddled together on the shore of the, uh, on the on the beach, the shore of the sea, and as they start to establish a Jewish community, what's one of the first things they built? A lighthouse. And the lighthouse shone a light every direction, and then the people who were swimming in the waters knew which way to swim, and less people drowned as a result. Guys, Yeshua Hamashiach, he is the light, he is the Migdal Eder, and he's saying, all who swim toward me, all who come toward me, will live. Migdal Eder, he is the tower to the flock. He is the light to our people. And we didn't even read the Migdal Eder verse, but it's so important. This is the first time you see it in scripture. All right. Let's go on over to Barakat HaGomel. Page 106. This is said by anyone in English or in Hebrew who is recovering from a serious illness, come back for safely from a long journey, or survived any kind of danger, including childbirth. Anyone here today want to say the blessing? Praise are you, Adonai, our God, ruler of the universe, who acts kindly towards the undeserving and has dealt kindly with you. May the one who bestowed goodness upon you continue to grant you every kind of goodness. It's good to have you back. Just so you know, I've thought about putting the words Migdal Eder in like big letters over top of our ark someday when we lift the ceiling a bit. I'm not sure. That's just one idea because then it creates the, the contrast between the Aron Chodesh and the tower for the flock. Just an idea I'm playing with still. Um, I've also thought about putting like a, a model lighthouse in the foyer with like a little plaque describing what it's there for. 
And by the way, anybody that has not seen anti-Semitism, we even got it when we were actually on the trip that we did for Thanksgiving. Yeah. Yeah. And our uh, our internet hate, the mean comments and such have increased toward us. Um, on Facebook or? Um, not on Facebook. On YouTube, where I promptly delete them. But also, we've received, in the last week or so, two negative reviews on Google. And neither of them have ever been here. And Google deleted the one, but the other is still there. And it's like, OK, well, if you're not getting insulted, then you're probably doing something right. No, wait. If you're getting insulted, you're doing something right. If you're not being insulted, then you're probably doing something wrong. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, page 108, a prayer for those in need of healing. Um, what we're going to do here is they're going to read to us a passage of scripture about healing. Uh, we're, they're going to begin the blessing. I'm going to point. As I go through, you just tell me, uh, you just shout the name of the person who needs to be prayed about. I'll lift up a few more, and then we will move on. Okay, our healing. Oh, I lost it. Hang on. <coughs> Our healing scripture this morning is from Matthew 4. Uh, 22, uh, 22 through 24. And Yeshua went about all the will, teaching in their congregations and proclaiming the good news of the rain and healing every disease and every bodily weakness among the people. And news about him went out into all Syria. And they brought to him all that were sick, afflicted with various diseases and pains, and those who were demon possessed and epileptics, epileptics and paralytics. And he healed them. I'm not sure I pronounced that right. But. And before we uh, do the, the prayer list, um, I'd like to say one thing. Um, David and Ruth, that are here today as our visitors, um, I have known them for years, and I saw them, and I thought, wow, I know those people. And, <laughs> and it took me a little while to figure out that you were from Dr. Chad's uh, Tour Tuesday, and Dr. Chad was a wonderful teacher, and I just loved him dearly. And these guys have been to Israel how many times? 25. 25? Wow, they must be rich. But anyway, <laughs> but um, I just welcome y'all, and I hope you come back. Okay. Okay, page 109. May the Holy Blessed One who blessed our ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, and Leah, bless and heal. Robert, Yonatan, Yarene, Yonatan, and his son, um, I think Joshua. Britt. Britt. Carol Todd, Samantha Jefferson, and Heather Bob. Gina, Naples, uh, Sarah, Naples, and Rachel, uh, Spirit. Francisca, the victims in Israel. Oh, yes. Would my sister count? She left us late. Johnny. May the Holy One give them support, courage, determination, and patience of spirit, granting physical and spiritual holders. May God in kindness strengthen and heal them, speak with body and soul together with others that are real, and let us say, Amen. 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 Page 110. Hear their voice, O God, when they call. Be gracious to them and answer them. In their hands the soul of all living things. We turn to down to give aid to those in distress. Grant them patience, faith, and courage. Never let despair overwhelm them. Be with them in difficult times. Help them to face their anxieties, confidence, and hope. Grant them of your healing power so that in vigor of body and mind they may return to their loved ones. For a life of blessing and sustenance. We want to help the God and give them their strength. For praising you, God, you learn about the sick. Page 112. And if we can go ahead and get uh, uh, my father appeared for uh, Hakba. 
or in other words, kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Okay. Five bucks. Rezat Torah, Asher Son Moshe, Livnei Bnei Yisrael, Av Yad Nadi Yad Moshe. It's Torah which Moshe set before the Israelites as God's word by Moshe's hand. Okay. Gosh, who should I summon? Um, my usual people aren't here to help me with this. Um, all right. Can I call up David? And David, could I ask you to help me today? <laughs> yeah, okay. David, if you would sit down. Yeah. And David, what you're going to do is you're going to help me redress the Torah scroll. Yeah, la, 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 ya <laughs> la she is a tree of life for those who are onto it and those who support it are happy. Its paths are pleasant and all its ways are peaceful. Our path throughout the day comes from the book of Obadiah. Praise for you, Adonai our God, ruler of the universe, who has chosen good prophets and was pleased with their words that were spoken in truth. Praise for you, Adonai, who chooses the Torah and Moses your servant, and Israel your people, and the prophets of truth and righteousness. The book of Obadiah. This is the vision of Obadiah. Here is what Adonai Elohim says about Edom. As a messenger was being sent among the nations, saying, Come on, let's attack her. We heard a message from Adonai. I am making you the least of all nations. You will be beneath contempt. Your proud heart has deceived you, you whose homes are caves in the cliffs, who live on the heights and say to yourselves, Who can bring me down to the ground? If you make your nest as high as an eagle's, even if you place it among the stars, I will bring you down from there, said Adonai. If these were to come to you, or if robbers by night, oh, how destroyed you are. Wouldn't they stop when they'd stolen enough? If grape pickers came to you, wouldn't they leave some grapes for cleaning? But see how Esau has been looted, their secret treasures searched out. Your allies went with you only to the border. Those at peace with you deceived and defeated you. Those who ate your food set a trap for you, and you couldn't discern it. When that day comes, says Adonai, won't I destroy all the wise men of Edom and leave no discernment on Mount Esau? Your wor warriors, Timon, will be so distraught that everyone on Mount Esau will be slaughtered. For the violence done to your kinsman, Yahakov, shame will cover you, and you will be forever cut off. On that day you stood aside while strangers carried off his treasure, and foreigners entered his gates to cast lots for Jerusalem. You were no different from them. You shouldn't have gloated over your kinsmen on their day of disaster, or rejoiced over the people of Yehuda on their day of destruction. You shouldn't have spoken arrogantly on a day of trouble, 
or even the gate of my people on their day of calamity. No, you shouldn't have gloated over their suffering on their day of calamity or laid hands on their treasure on their day of calamity. You shouldn't have stood at the crossroads to cut down their fugitives or handed over their survivors on a day of trouble. For the day of Adonai is near for all nations. As you did, it will be done to you. Your dealings will come back on your own head. For just as you have drunk on my holy mountain, so will all the nations drink in turn. Yes, they will drink and gulp it down and be as if they had never existed. But on Mount Zion there will be a holy remnant who will escape, and the house of Yaakov will repossess their rightful inheritance. The house of Yaakov will be a fine, be a fire, and the house of Yosef a flame, setting a flame and consuming the stubble which is the house of Esau. None of the house of Esau will remain, for Adonai has spoken. Those in the Negev will repossess the mountains of Esau, and those in the Shephelah in the land of Philistine. They will repossess the fields of Ephraim and the field of Shamron, and Benjamin will occupy Gilead. Those from this army of the people of Israel, exiled among the Canaanim, as far away as Zarphat, and the exiles from Jerusalem and Sephirod, will repossess the cities in the Negev. Then the victorious will ascend Mount Zion to rule over Mount Esau, but the kingship will belong to Adonai. Praise for you, Adonai, our God, ruler of the universe, rock of all the worlds, righteous in every generation, the faithful God who says it and it is done, who speaks and it is fulfilled. Next passage comes from the book of Matthew, excuse me, beginning in chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2, I'm going to start in verse 13. After they had gone, an angel of Adonai appeared to Yosef in a dream and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and escape to Egypt, and stay there until I tell you to leave. For Herod is going to look for the child in order to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother, and left during the night for Egypt, where he stayed until Herod died. This happened in order to fulfill what Adonai had said to the prophet, Out of Egypt I called my son. Meanwhile, when Herod realized that the Magi had tricked him, he was furious and gave orders to kill all the boys in and around Bethlehem who were two years old or less, calculating from the time the Magi had told him. In this way were fulfilled the words spoken through the prophet Yermiyahu. A voice heard in Ramah, sobbing and lamenting loudly. It was Rachel sobbing for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no longer alive. After Herod's death, an angel of Adonai appeared in a dream to Yosef in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go to Eretz Israel, for those who wanted to kill the child are dead. So he got up, took the child and his mother, and went back to Eretz Israel. However, when he heard that Archelaus had succeeded his father Herod as king of Yehuda, he was afraid to go there. Warned in a dream, he withdrew to the Galil, and settled in a town called Nazareth, so that what had been spoken by the prophets might be fulfilled, that he would be called a Nazarite. <laughs> All God's words are truth and righteousness. For you are faithful, Adonai, our God, and your words are trustworthy. Not one word of yours is ever taken back unfulfilled. For you are a dependable and merciful ruler. Praise are you, Adonai, the God, who is dependable in all of your words. Have mercy on Zion, for she is our life's home. Save the humble soul quickly in our day. Praise for you, Adonai, who causes Zion and her children to rejoice. Cause us to rejoice, Adonai, our God, with Elijah the prophet, your servant, and with the kingdom of David, your anointed. May he quickly come and gladden our hearts. May no stranger sit on his throne, and may no others inherit his glory. For you bowed to him by your holy name, that his light would never be extinguished. Praise are you, Adonai, shield of David. 118. And for your Torah, and for the worship, and for the prophets, and for the Shabbat day that you gave us, Adonai our God, for holiness and for rest, for glory and splendor. For all these, Adonai our God, we thank you and praise you. May your name be praised perpetually forever. Praise are you, Adonai, who sanctifies the Shabbat. On page 121. This is a prayer for our nation. We ask that you pray along 
with me as I lead. Our God and God of our ancestors, please accept with mercy our prayer for our land and its government. Teach our leaders the values of the Torah, help them understand the rules of righteousness. So the land may we never lie in tranquility, prosperity, and freedom. Not an eye, God of the world, all flesh, since the Spirit told all the time to be clean. Find love, brotherhood, peace, and friendship among all the nationalities and faiths of the land. Uproot from their hearts any hatred or enmity. Jealousy or rivalry to fulfill the good things of your children, who delight in its honor and desire to see things alike for all the nations. May it be your will that our land will be a blessing to all the inhabitants of the world, and that friendship and freedom will reign between them, and the vision of your prophets will soon be fulfilled. Amen. Page 123, another prayer for the state of Israel. I'm going to ask you to pray alongside me. Our Heavenly Father, Rock of Israel and its Redeemer, bless the state of Israel, first flowering of our redemption. Show it under your loving wings and spread over it your sukkah peace. Send your light and truth to its leaders, ministers, and advisors, and guide them brightly with your good advice. Strengthen the hands of the defenders of our holy land and lead them with God to the limits. Crown their efforts with victory. Grant peace to the land and eternal happiness to its inhabitants. And let us all say, Amen. Avinu, Avinu, Shiva Shemayim, Sor Yisrael, Beko Alo. Everyone say it with me. Avinu, Avinu, Shiva Shemayim, Sor Yisrael, Beko Alo. Four, right? Page 128. And, um, hmm. Tatiana, uh, your son's name, was it uh, Emmanuel? Emmanuel. Oops, uh, too late. I was going to offer him to open up the doors. Um, <laughs> too late. <My> bad. <laughs> we're, so to, we're so used. You're so in the rhythm. Let me see. Here, how about you help me uh, down here with the doors? Would you like to carry it? Uh, yeah, keep coming. Hallelujah, Oh no, Oh no, I the Page one thirty. Psalm of David, a tribute to Adonai, mighty ones, a tribute to God, in glory and strength, a tribute to Adonai, the glory of God's name. Bow before Adonai in the beauty of holiness. Adonai's voice is over the waters, the God of glory thunders. Adonai is over the many waters. Adonai's voice sounds with power. Adonai's voice sounds with beauty. Adonai's voice breaks cedars. Adonai shatters the cedars of Lebanon. God makes them leap like a calf, Lebanon and Syrian like a wild ox. Adonai's voice carves out flames of fire. Adonai's voice makes the desert quake. Adonai makes the desert of Kadesh quake. Adonai's voice causes deer to give birth and strips the forest bare. In God's sanctuary, all speak of God's glory. 
Adonai sat enthroned for flood. Adonai is enthroned as ruler forever. Adonai will give strength to God's people. Adonai will bless God's people with peace. Amen. All right. What's it? Page 136? Uh, 134 and 135. 134. It's a yo-yo-mahar. And when the ark rested, Moses would say, Return Adonai to the millions of Israel. Rise up Adonai to your resting place, the temple, you and the ark of your strength. May your priests be clothed in righteousness and your faithful sing with joy. For the sake of David, your servant, do, do not reject your anointed one. I have given you good teaching. Do not leave my Torah. It is a tree of life for those who hold on to it and those who support it are happy. Its paths are pleasant and all its ways are peaceful. Return us to you, Adonai, and we shall return. Renew our days as in days of old. That's Kaim He, starting six lines from the bottom on the right hand. As Kaim He, the Mahakzeha, the Tokeha, Mehushar. As Kaim He, the Mahakzeha, the Tokeha, Mehushar. Yerkeha. I'm going to sing a different song today. Uh, let's just, it's in my heart. Uh, let's, let's try it. I will sing a song of hope, sing along. God of heaven, come down, heaven, come down. Just to know you and your love is enough. God of heaven, come down. Heaven, come down. Join with me. Ya la la la, ya la 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 la. Ya la 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 la, heaven come down. La 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 la. Ya la 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 la, ya la 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 la. Eh, I can put it on the boards sometime in the future. Let's sing um, Yeshua Hamashiach. Yeshua Hamashiach Adonai. Yeshua HaMashiach Adonai Yeshua HaMashiach Yeshua HaMashiach Yeshua HaMashiach Adonai Indeed, that's who we're here to honor today. Let's go to Matiyahu chapter 5. We have a survey of the scriptures ahead of us today. And, oh my word, I am excited. Because I, because <clears throat> last week it was mentioned to me um, that I, I was kind of basing my argument on maybe a flawed argument, uh, on flawed logic. And the flawed logic was this, that Messiah Yeshua taught us that we are the salt of the earth, and the light of the world. And I argued that these are two different roles. That the salt of the earth is the land of Israel, Aretz, Haaretz, and that the light to the world, the Goyim, is a separate calling. Um, and I wanted to address that today. And I want to go ahead and give kind of a survey of everything we've been doing, because we've been learning about the Sermon on the Mount. And I believe very firmly that these are the words that define us. These are the words that define every aspect of our life. Everything that we will come across will be an exercise in some aspect of this teaching. And that's why Messiah Yeshua takes it so seriously. But I want to start us off from the beginning. And today's lesson is let's learn Torah. You'd think that would be obvious. That's what we do every week, right? Let's learn Torah. So we're going to go through some different passages of Scripture. It'll be kind of like sword drills today. Anyone ever do sword drills? Yeah, I did. But if you did them, <laughs> you know, this is your chance. Um, I've heard about them. So the first one is Yeshiyahu 61, verses 1 through 3. Yeshiyahu, that's the book of Isaiah, 61, 1 through 3. And if you're used to the Hebrew Bible, and you have an English, like a normal like Christian Bible in front of you, I'm sorry. And you have a Christian, if you're used to the Christian Bible, and you're used to the Hebrew Bible, I'm also, or if you have a Hebrew Bible, I'm also sorry. It's a confusing experience, I know. Found it. Anyone else? Oh, Mike found it first. 
Read the first three verses for me, please. The spirit of Adonai Elohim is upon me, because Adonai has appointed me to announce good news to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom to the captives, to let out into light those bound in the dark, to proclaim the year of the favor of Adonai and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, yes, provide for those in Zion who mourn, give them garlands instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, a cloak of praise instead of a heavy spirit, so that they will call to, that they will be called oaks of righteousness, planted by Adonai, in which he takes pride. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. There is so much there to unpack. But the verses that I want us to see today is blessed are the repentant, because theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Let's go to verse one. The spirit of Adonai. Um, we'll say Hashem is upon me because Hashem has anointed me to reach to preach good news to the humble. And we said that that's what being poor in spirit is a euphemism for. It's the humble. It's those who are downtrodden. And what has Hashem sent them to do? Or sent Mashiach to do? To bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, the openings of the opening of eyes for those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of Hashem. And we say, I point this out, I point this out because the rabbis also understood that this passage was about Mashiach. And they said that Mashiach literally sits at the gates of well, the city of Rome, for example. Uh, this is where this story takes place. And he sits with the lepers. And every morning he unwraps their wounds and then he rewraps them of, with fresh bandages. And the idea here is that Messiah is there to bind up our wounds. He's there to not only help us in our suffering, He's there to take on our suffering and suffer with us. It's truly, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Look at verses 2 and 3. To comfort all who mourn, to appoint to those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, the garment, a prayer shawl, of praise instead of a spirit of infirmity. Who is he comforting? The children of Israel. He's comforting those who live in Zion. He's here to proclaim to them the year of Hashem's favor. You've got to understand that the gospel is announced to the people of Israel first. It was given to them and saying, if you accept this, the kingdom can come now. Unfortunately, by the end of Mashiach's ministry, he says, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, if only you had recognized the hour of your visitation. You will not see me again, O Jerusalem, Zion, until you say, say it with me, Baruch Abba B'Shem Adonai, blessed is he who comes in the name of Hashem. But who's being comforted? Those who mourn for Jerusalem. Those who mourn for Zion. Because when we mourn for Zion, and we mourn that we don't have a Davidic king, Messiah, when we mourn, that the, the covenant has, that we have no more temple. When we mourn that the fullness of the prophecies have not been fulfilled, that, that Gentiles are not going up to Jerusalem to learn the law of the Lord. When we, rec when we mourn that the world is not the way that the prophets promised us it would be, Messiah tells us you are comforted because the year of Hashem's favor is here and it's going to reach its fullness. This pertains to the people of Israel. Look at Psalms, let's go to Psalms 37, verse 11. Got it. Anyone else? Oh, my word. You beat me? Okay, go for it. <laughs> yes. But the meek will inherit the land and delight themselves in abundant peace. All right. Context here. Because it says the meek will inherit the earth, right? Context. We're talking about the land of Israel. What's it saying? That if you are, and we talked about this, the humble remnant. If you are those who are in Israel and you are downtrodden, but Hashem recognizes your righteousness surrounded by wickedness, he says you will inherit the land. Not just the whole earth. You will inherit the very best part of the world. You will inherit the land of Israel. It is your inheritance. And how do we get there? Humility. Okay. You said it's exactly uh, 
the seven after the event. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we talked about that, didn't we? And I said, who will own the land? It's that righteous remnant. Good reminder, Christian. Thank you. Um, okay, the next one is Hosea 10, 12. If you can't see, I was already flipping there to beat Mike. Um, oh, no. Oh, no. Shoot, did you get there? It's like I had it and I kept... I was <laughs> Hosea 10, 12. Okay, I got it. Anyone else? Oh, Shannon already beat me. Okay, go ahead. So to yourselves in righteousness, reap according to kindness, break up your follow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord until he comes and rains righteousness on you. All right. So let's talk about that. This one is not as verbatim, but it's once again, righteousness is being compared to food. Righteousness is being compared to that which we reap. If you sow in righteousness, you will receive the righteousness. It will be rained upon you. And he himself will teach you. Which is one of the great promises of scripture. That Hashem himself will teach us. He'll teach our children. Which, I mean, don't get me wrong. When I come up here, I try to teach you the words of our Master Yeshua the Messiah. And I recognize these as the words. But they're still coming through a human filter. There are things I don't know. And there are things that my research is incomplete. But one day, it will be Messiah Yeshua himself who is teaching you. Messiah Yeshua himself will be teaching our children. And where will we, we be learning? Well, we'll be learning in the yeshiva, in Jerusalem, on the Temple Mount. That's where he's going to teach us. It's going to be a wonderful time. I want to go there. I want to go to that yeshiva. 2 Samuel 22, verse 26. That's a lot of twos. 2 Samuel 22, 26. Some of you are having an uncomfortable flashback to school. I'm not. I was homeschooled. 2 Samuel 22, 6. 26. Got it. Mike, do you have it? Absolutely. You do? Go for it. <laughs> okay. 2 Samuel 22, verse 26. With the merciful, you are merciful. With the champion of purity, you are pure. Go ahead and read the next verse. With the honest, you are honest, and with the crooked, you are kind. And another word, another word for honest there is, with the pure, you will show yourself pure. And with the um, perverse, you will show yourself perverse. Basically, what you bring to the table with Hashem is what you get. And that's why some people, no matter what you do, no matter how much goodness from Hashem they see, they will never be thankful they will never, ever say, wow, amen, let me rejoice with you, because it's not in them. It's not in them. But that first one, with the merciful, you show yourself mercy, uh, merciful. And then it says, with the pure, you show yourself pure. I'm looking at verses five and, or 7 and 8 right now. Blessed are the pure in heart. I'm sorry. Blessed are those who forgive, because they will be forgiven. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. And we also know that... Um, the pure in heart is referenced in Psalms 24, verses 3 and 4. Who can ascend the mountain of the Lord? He who has a pure heart, clean hands, has not sworn by what is false. I'm sorry, has not dedicated his life to what is false, has not sworn falsely. So right off the bat, we see, okay, what you bring to the table is what God will give to you. Let's do one or two more. Psalm 37, 7, uh, 37, 37. I've officially just lost my way. Here we go. Who's got it? Just someone raise your hand. Oh, Laura's good. Psalms 37, 37. Look perfect man and see the upright for there Okay. I feel that one's pretty okay. It's not verbatim. Um, but basically it is, if you're peaceful, you are marked. And you are one of the children of God. Okay? The, the peaceful ones are marked. Uh, Isaiah 32, 17. And then we'll do one more. Okay. Who's got it? Do 
said 3217. I'm sorry. What chapter, what book did I say? Okay, just making sure. Go ahead. No, I, I don't have that. Oh. I, I was like looking at my Who has it? Mike has it. Let's go. The effect of righteousness will be peace. The result of righteousness, faith, trust, whatever. All right. Again, and I'm going to, I'm going to go check out my verse because I thought I had a better verse for this one. Um, let me go check this out. No. Okay, that one's coming up, though. Um, once again, blessed are the peace. They are going to be recognized. They are going to be called the charm of God. The peacemakers now will, re- will inherit peace in the world to come. Okay, the last one for, for now is verse 10. I'm sorry. Um, is Proverbs 21, 21. And this pertains to blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs. The king- I'm sorry, those who are persecuted because theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Twenty one twenty one. Proverbs twenty one twenty one. Okay. Go for it. He who pursues righteousness and loving commitment finds life, righteousness, and esteem. All right, and the word pursues there, a more accurate way of translating the sentence is blessed are those who are pursued for the sake of righteousness. For there's the kingdom of heaven. That word persecuted is literally the word pursued. And so you can see Messiah is doing a play on words, uh, play on words here. Blessed are those who, are, who pursue righteousness. Blessed are those who are pursued because of righteousness. Um, I feel that there are better verses than some of the ones that I have in front of me today pertaining to those who suffer in this world, they will reap an, an inheritance in the world to come. Um, and I have a few verses that I used last time. Um, 2 Corinthians 36, 16, for example. Um, Numbers 18, 19. 2 Chronicles 13, 5 where we were using these verses, uh, these last two, last week, talking about the salt of the land. What does it mean to be salt to the land of Israel? The house of Aharon, the house of David, this is salt for the land of Israel. And what it means is that the house of Israel is preserved by the Davidic dynasty when it's righteous, and by the house of Aaron when it's righteous. But when they cease to be righteous, suddenly the whole house of Israel is thrown into perversity. And what Messiah Yeshua is saying is the Messianic community is salt for the land of Israel. And what he's saying is, I believe, you are also a light to the Gentile nations. And so a Messianic Jewish community must have a responsibility to the house of Israel as salt, as a preserving factor, and it must be a light to Gentile nations. And scripture promises us that this is, the, this is fulfilled one day when all the Gentile nations go up to Zion to learn the law of the Lord. And the word of the Lord shall go forth from Zion, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Swords will be beaten into plowshares, and nations will not learn war again. He will teach us his ways. That's the Messianic promise. And you can see it's not specific to the people of Israel. But the people of Israel have a responsibility to teach the whole world. And we live in a very unique day and age right now. When right now the fullness of that prophecy hasn't happened, but Hashem has started calling in Jews and Gentiles into his covenant provided by the, by the mountain and by Messiah Yeshua. And what we're seeing right now is the beginning of what we see fulfilled in Isaiah 66, I think it's 21, where it says that he will choose many from Gentile nations to be priests in his temple. And so we see that the covenant that was given to Aaron is going to be expanded. It's going to include more people. And we see that happening right now where people of all nations are being called into understand and know Torah. Because what is the primary responsibility of a priest? According to um, Malachi chapter 3, the calling of a priest is to preserve words of Torah, to preserve wisdom, to teach fools wisdom and understanding. That's our responsibility. It's not so that when I come here, I can put a little feather in my cap and say, look what I know. I've got news for you. Many, many Messianic Jews and many Messianic Gentiles who are called into Messianic Judaism, it becomes a source of pride because Scripture says that knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. They have all the knowledge, but they lack the love that comes from actually knowing Messiah. And it does them no good. And it does no one else any good. They have become salt that is not salty, which is unfortunate because in real life, how does salt lose its saltiness? 
It can't. It's a silly question. Salt cannot lose its saltiness. Messiah Yeshua is asking a stupid question, like on purpose. He's being he's being ridiculous. How can salt lose its saltiness? Likewise, it should be absurd that there are Messianic Jewish believers and Christian Gentiles in the Sunday Church who do not who hear these words. They claim to be salt of the earth, a light to the Gentile nations, and they don't do anything with it. It should be inconceivable. Unfortunately, very often it's the reality. So that is a quick review of the Sermon on the Mount so far. And what I, why did I bring us through all those scriptures and kind of show you the Sermon on the Mount does not, how do I put this? The Sermon on the Mount does not introduce much new. And that might surprise you, but it's in harmony with the rest of scripture. And I like how I've heard it put, um, I think Stern said this one. I, I, I have to double check that. I think Stern, it's a reestablishment of what's already been taught. It's just laying down the basics. It's not supposed to be a profound new teaching. And if you look at how the crowd reacts to this sermon, there it doesn't say they were amazed at the um, they were amazed at what he was saying and all the new words, but they're just amazed at his authority. His authority. What does that mean? That means they're listening and that something in their heart says, these are the words of a king. Talking about the salt, I'll tell you something you probably didn't know. I want to hear it. Go to the desert salt mines and um, any abandoned desert salt mine. You're talking about salt losing its taste and flavor yeah. and taste. I'll tell you how that works. Now, when they mine through the salt mines to a certain point, you start losing the salt because and they have a certain type of salt, is what they call it, which is actually poison. It doesn't have the flavor of salt. When you eat it, you'll die. All they can do is use it for roads and everything else. It's literally something you trample on. So I'll say this right now. My commentaries actually said salt can't lose its saltiness. So that's news to me. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not disagreeing with you. I'm just saying, let me go look into that. It's the poisons that are sitting on the, so, from the outer side of it. Shannon, I'm going to assume you're telling me the truth. I, I'm, I'm going to assume you're right. Let's work with that. Salt that's lost its saltiness is Poison. poison. People who are not salty for Messiah and acting to preserve the people of Israel, a, a Messian community that doesn't care about Israel, a Messian community that doesn't care about real Jews, a Messian community that has no heart for others is toxic. That's also why they do the, I forget the name of the place, but the speed things to check the speed and all that in Utah on that because the salt plains there are actually toxic. So you mean I can't, I can't just like go up and start licking the roads? Nope. Okay. <laughs> Eating some fries. Quick, just go out to the run. <laughs> okay. Thank you for telling me that, Shannon. Um, it's inconceivable that a healthy Messianic Jewish community is not salt. And we see this in history, where Lichtenstein becomes a Messianic Jew. And what does he do? He writes up a prayer for the restoration of the Jewish community. The, Jewish, the Messianic Jewish community was the first group of Zionists. Not what Zionism be, uh, like what it became, but they were the first ones who said, return to the land. This is like late 1800s, mid-1800s. Yeah, wow. absolutely. Um, in fact, um, Theophilus Lucky wrote a great deal about it in one of the first Hebrew magazines in the United States. So understand, they were passionate. Let's return to the land. And what happens? Within 100 years, there is a state of Israel. There hadn't been for 2,000 years, but the Messianic Jewish community starts praying for it, and it exists. What do you think would happen if the Messianic Jewish community became so serious about prayer that we prayed in the return of the Messiah? I think that's what's going to happen. Because scripture says, when you, Jerusalem, say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, then he returns. Gent like, non-believing Jews aren't going to be praying that. That's Messianic Jews. And so I think that Messianic Jews are going to go back to Jerusalem, and we're going to be the ones who pray in and welcome Messiah back. So when I pray the Amidah, and I'm praying for the restoration of Jerusalem. One of the things I'm praying for is the restoration of the Jewish, the Messianic Jewish community to Jerusalem. I have a, a very serious question. It can wait till after, sir. Yeah, if you don't mind. Um, let's go on into verses 17 through verses 20. Do not think I have come to do away with the Torah or the prophets. I did not come to do away with them, but to bring abundance. For the Torah, the teachings, to be obeyed as it should be, and God's promises to receive fulfillment. I'm sorry, I'm reading the uh, the one new man translation. It's kind of quirky, um, but they've got they've got good footnotes. 
For truly I say to you, until the sky and the earth should pass away, not one yud, not one vav, could ever pass away from the Torah until everything has come to pass. Therefore, whoever would break one of the least of the commandments and would teach other people this way will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever would keep the commandments and teach them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you, unless your righteousness would be present in abundance more than the uh, scribes and Pharisees, you could not enter the kingdom of heaven. I have heard this passage misused every single way on both sides of the ditch. One group of people, they'll say, Messiah Yeshua kept it all perfectly, so we don't need to, we don't need to know it anymore. And they won't even teach it. Yet they, he says, blessed are those who teach it, who know them, keep them, and teach them. But on the flip side, I've heard some, especially in the Hebrew roots camp, say, well, now everyone has to keep the Torah the same. And simply put, if you look at scripture, there is a distinction between the amount of mitzvot that a Gentile is supposed to keep versus a Jew, versus a man, versus a woman, versus a priest, versus a king. There are different categories, and not everyone is held to the exact same standard. And so I, 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 I don't want to fall into a ditch today, but what I'm going to say is this, and it's a very simple message. If you, if you consider yourself some sort of a Messianic Jew or a Messianic Gentile, we have a special responsibility to know Torah. I was in, uh, living in Israel. My, 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 my roommate was um, an Old Testament uh, a theology major uh, and master's level. He was master's. Um, and his boss sat him down one day and just said, why are you wasting your time with this nonsense? Why do you waste your time with the Old Testament? And he just kind of chewed him out. And I thought to myself, you got the wrong guy. Aaron knows that he doesn't keep it. You should have talked to the Messianic Jew. Um, the Messianic Jew may have given you, may have chewed you out in return. Um, I probably would have said, did Messiah Yeshua say anything like that? Did Messiah Yeshua know the Torah? Here's the thing. I'll say this to you now. The only way to access the kingdom of heaven is by faith in Messiah Yeshua. The only way into the family of God is by faith in Messiah Yeshua. But do you want to be like our master? Do you want to know his words better? Do you want to live his lifestyle? How many of us want to progress in that process of sanctification? You're going to have to know his words. And you're going to find that his words find context in the Torah. And as we go through this, we're going to see that it's not that he's really disagreeing a lot with the scribes and the Pharisees. But what he's doing is he's saying the level of halakha that is correct. And he's saying... Sometimes he's agreeing with some groups of scribes, and sometimes he's disagreeing with other scribes. Sometimes he's agreeing with some Pharisees and not other Pharisees. But what he's doing here is he's saying, let me bring a correct interpretation to this Torah. So some of it's all out of whack. Let's put it back into whack. I'm not sure that's back into sync. I don't know. Guys, we have a special responsibility to know Torah. And so last week, I should have put the verses into context about salt. Where do I get this conclusion from? I get it from Torah, where I see, okay, the people are a salt to the land of Israel. And as we go through the upcoming sections, we're going to be looking at, we're going to be saying, where does this come from in Torah? So it says, do not be angry. Is that found in Torah? Surprisingly. It says, do not be lustful. Is that in Torah? Yeah. Teachings about divorce. Yes. Teachings about pledges, yes. Teachings in retaliation, love for enemies, charitable gifts, prayer, Lord's Prayer. Uh, that one's more mean hog, it's different. Teachings about fasting, get, uh, treasure in heaven. Yes, yes, yes. We're going to find that it's in symmetry with, with the rest of Torah. We're going to find that it's in symmetry with the rest of Torah. And one of my challenges to you is we are a people who love Torah. Somebody called me this week and he said, my girlfriend, is his fiance, is a Messianic Jew. Well, that's a scary sentence right off the bat. Everything, every hair on my body goes up. Because who knows what that means? And he said, I was hoping you could explain this to me. And I said, well, I can't speak for your girlfriend. I can't. Because I said, unfortunately, Messianic Judaism is a small, young movement, and we're already as varied as the Sunday church. I said, but let me lay out for you two principles that most Messianic Jews seem drawn to. Hebrew roots, Messianic Jews, we're all kind of on a spectrum. There's two foundations we usually agree on. Number one, the significance of Torah. Usually. And number two, the significance of the people of Israel. And I explained it to him. And I said that lots of people were taught that the Torah is bad, not worth learning. But the words of Messiah always portray it as good. 
he kept Torah, and at the very least, he knew Torah and taught it. And so we should at least understand Torah and what he is trying to pull out of it and how it increases our, um, how it increases our, I'm sorry, to our ability to walk as his disciples. And so am I really here to teach us this Torah for the sake of knowledge? No, I'm here to teach us Torah so we can be better disciples of the Master Yeshua, the Messiah. That's my true heart's desire. Um, and I want to be like him. And I want to be known by him. And I want my lifestyle to reflect perfectly his teachings. Why do I say this? Why is it so important? I'll show you why. Because we're, we've been focusing so much on the first part of the Sermon on the Mount, I'm going to finish today by reading to you the last part of the Sermon on the Mount. How many of us here, and I'm, I'm glad that this teaching doesn't seem prevalent in this congregation, how many of us here have heard the teaching, you cannot te keep the Sermon on the Mount, it is too hard, it's there to show us why we need grace? Okay, about three or four of us. Chapter 7, verse 24. For everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will become like a prudent man who built his house upon the rock. And the rain came down, and the rivers came up, and the winds blew and beat that house, but it did not fall, for it had been founded on the rock. What is the rock? Messiah Yeshua and, in this context, the Torah, and specifically his teachings about the Torah. His teachings who hear these words of mine and obey them. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not keep them will be like a foolish man who built his house upon the sand. Every time you hear a preacher tell you, you can't keep the Sermon on the Mount, it's too hard, it's there to show you why you need grace, that preacher is teaching you a foolish doctrine that will fall on the day of judgment. Rain came down, rivers came up, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and they fell, and its fall was great. Or I like another translation, it fell with a great crash. It fell with a great crash. One of the ways I know someone's about to go apostate, they've met, they're starting to make a lot of noise. And they're trying to puff up to compensate for the lack of foundation that's been built. And you can very often see it. Guys, I don't want my house to fall on the judgment. I want my house to stand. I just hit the Bible. Stand. I want it to stand. I don't want to be in front of the judgment seat and see my house fall apart because he's going to say to me, did you hear these words? I'm going to say yes. In fact, I learned a lot of them in Hebrew. And he's going to say, that did you no good if you didn't keep them. It's very important to me that we look at this, that, that we look at his halakha, we look at his teachings about the Torah, and we say, this is how we apply them because we are his true disciples. All the fat cut off, that's what it's about. We want to be his disciples because we want to, our house to be built at the judgment seat and we want to have a really great reward. Not enter life as one who escaped from a fire or not, not as one who doesn't merit life. Faith in Messiah Yeshua is all you need for salvation, but he says that his words are necessary to stand at the judgment. And I can't tell you what that means. All I have to do is hold up both and say, faith in Messiah alone, but also here's his words, and by his own words, prophetic words, we must, that he expects us to keep them. You want to be a disciple? We've got to learn Torah, and we've got to learn his words. And so that's one of the reasons last year I taught you Torah. This year, we have to go back and forth, and we have to stay in a healthy tension. Anyone else? Does anyone have any questions or have anything they want to say before we break today? This is a huge topic, and I keep on going into it, and I keep on feeling like we have to hop back and forth because so many people have fallen into abuses, one side or the other. I have a um, verse. I don't know if you have one. Okay. It's in Marcos. Mark? Uh -huh. um, chapter 9, verse 15. 9? 15? 9, verse 15. 9, 15. You want to read it? And sure. Say And immediately the whole crowd saw him, and they were thoroughly amazed as if, um, and as they were running, 
up, they were greeting him. Is that the first? 50. 50. Okay, I'm sorry. Wrong verse. Salt is good, but if salt would become saltless, with what will you season it? You have salt in yourselves, and you must continually live in peace with one another. Okay, so this is actually a fascinating concept, and I'm going to write, I think, a booklet about this one day. Because very often when you see the teachings of Messiah Yeshua repeated, it has a different meaning the second time he says it. This is talking about peacefulness. This is actually, believe it or not, a different teaching. It's the te connection between salt and light that makes me say, okay, we're talking about salt to the land of Israel and light to the nation of Israel, I mean, to the nations. And just to clarify, what is the light? Messiah. Messiah. But there's a great song. People sing this. The Torah is the light. The Torah is the lamp. What is the light? The mitzvot. In other words, his teachings are the light, and us living out his teachings by performing mitzvot, I'm sorry, that's the lamp, that's the light. And so what is the end result of obeying his words? People will see your good deeds and do what? Glorify your Father in heaven. The result of performing mitzvot is about leading to praise for our Father in heaven. What will make the nation of Israel see the light of Messiah? It is the mitzvot of the Messianic Jewish community. It's our good deeds. What will make people see the light of Messiah? By keeping his words. The mitzvot. Keeping his words leads people to glorify him. So usually you will never, ever recognize Messiah until the Messianic Jewish community gets very serious about being salt to the land of Israel. I say that because there are four synagogues in Nashville. Four synagogues. I, I challenge you, I ask people all the time, how many of us have been to one? And if you've been to two or three, that also counts. Okay, people are raising their hands. Let me ask you this question. Where is your heart for the people of Israel? And if the synagogue is too much because you're here, fine. How many of us have been to the JCC or to a kosher bakery? Okay, you're starting to get the idea. Being a part of the land of Israel does not necessarily mean you're passing out tracts. What it means is that you're a part of the community of Israel and you are living the lifestyle of Messiah Yeshua. That is what it means to be a light, to be salt for the land of Israel and a light to the nations. As I said, it does you no good if all you've got is knowledge, but no obedience. Love builds up, I'm sorry. Knowledge builds up, no, I got it right the first time. Knowledge puffs up, love builds up. We have to be people of love. We have to be people of actions. We have to be a people of mitzvot. How do we get there? We study Messiah Yeshua and his words. So, so how then will the Messianic Jewish community will, did you say, did you say pray in Jerusalem for the Messiah Yeshua? I believe, personally, that the Messianic Jewish community in Israel, is what's good, in Jerusalem, is what's going to bring back Messiah. Because if you look at the ministry of Messiah, there's revival breaking out all through Israel especially in the Galilee area. He has crowds and crowds, like thousands and thousands. We don't realize how popular Messiah Yeshua was. But when he comes to Jerusalem, he said, if Jerusalem had known, if Jerusalem had said, Baruch Hashem Adonai, if it had welcomed him as Messiah, the Messianic era would have begun. Mm -hmm. But he said, that's been taken away from you. So my question would be, if we know anti would be the problem in our world. Yes. But also the opposite of that, the, 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 the hatred of the Christian symbolism. It's just that Christianity as a whole from the Jewish community. Well, that's because Christians, especially, and I'll say it, the Catholic and the Orthodox, um, live a lifestyle that is an abomination, not only to Jews and Torah, but Muslims as well. You know, none of those faiths even will permit a statue. And what do the uh, churches do everywhere? They put giant statues in front of their churches. And, I mean, like, it's so intense. The people of Israel in the time of Mel uh, David HaMelech did not make statues. We don't have statues of David. We don't have statues because it was forbidden. And here we are, because we say the Torah doesn't count anymore, we're making statues and things. And unfortunately, this is a good example of us not knowing Torah. And so we have become tasteless to the people of Israel. Not only to the Christian community, but to the Muslim community. I mean, do you think the Father of the Cross, for example? That's a good question. And that I would say that a cross is more permissible because the Torah says, like, not in the shape of a, a bird, a fish, a, an animal, or a man. A cross kind of falls into middle territory. But especially like... 
like if you go to the Church of, uh, of Gethsemane, four big statues on pillars right in front of the Dome of the Rock. And it's like everyone who passes it says abomination. So I'm not familiar with that. So this is a forbidden in Judaism to build statues at, like, anywhere, even in a museum? Especially in a synagogue. Now, that's that's art that's different, but an Orthodox would tell you no. Well, it says, that's like, it's like, it's like an idol. Yeah. To worship an idol would be different than... It says statue. It says graven image. Yeah. Okay. Now, people often misinterpret it because we have to be able to get around some of these things. And there is question about what counts as a molten, as a graven image. Yeah. You know, why was it permissible to put a sta uh, statues of the cherubim and the base of Mikdash, but not, um, but not, uh, you know, it, 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 gets, it gets into Ray territory. Mm -hmm. But my question to you would be, are you seriously engaging with whether it's Messiah or are we trying to get around them? And what leads us to be the best disciples possible? I have to go ahead and close up now. If you had another question, I'm sorry. Let's go to page 162. Uh, we'll just sing the El Ink Elohenu. Ink Elohenu, Ink Adonehenu, Ink Mapehu, Ink Moshi Ainu, Mik Elohenu, Mik Adonehenu, Mik Mapehu, Mik Moshi Ainu. No de lelo heinu, no de la donne heinu, no de lemo keinu, no de la moshi heinu, baruch elo heinu, baruch a donne heinu, baruch a keinu, baruch moshi heinu, atahu ala heinu, atahu ala heinu, atahu ma keinu, atahu moshi heinu, atahu shaktiru, abu teinu. Then, then God will be ruler over all the earth. On that day, God will be one, and God's name will be one. Amen. Page 168. If anyone here is mourning the loss of a loved one somewhere in the last 11 months or is coming up on a one year anniversary of a passing, uh, raise your hand. Okay. Uh, just you two. What? I'm just saying, raise my hand too, because. Yeah, yeah. Would you guys like to lead it? Yes. Sir. Okay. <clears throat> we'll do it in English. Or do you want to do it in Hebrew? I'll do it in English. Okay, go for it. May God's great name be made great Amen. and holy in the world. May God create among to God's will. May God establish the divine kingdom soon in our days, quickly, and in the near future, and let's say, Amen. 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 May God's, God's great name be praised, praised forever and ever. Blessed, praised, glorified, and raised high, honored and elevated by the name of the Holy Blessed One. Far beyond all blessings, blessings and psalms, praises and comforts that people can't say, and let us say. Amen. Amen. May there be a of peace from heaven and for us, for all Israel, and say, Amen. May the one who makes peace in the high places, may be peace for us and for all Israel, and let us say, Amen. All right. May you go out in the grace and peace of our Master, Yeshua the Messiah. You are dismissed. Shavua Tov. Please join us in the back for Oneg. We have a lot of food today. A lot of blueberries. <laughs>